John Calvin, and uh, you may want to turn in your Bibles to Job chapter 1, and where we'll read from verse 20 and 22, and the sermon will be based upon this. We'll begin by reading from Job 1, 20 through 22. Then Job arose and ran down upon the ground and worshipped and said, Naked came I of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. We may well say that patience is a great virtue, as indeed it is, since there are very few who know what the word patience means, from which fact it might be concluded that we hardly value being patient and having this virtue at which we grasp so long. Now God, seeing such indifference on the part of men, wishes to put before their eyes that which is so needful for us. For if we are not patient, our faith must have vanished. For it cannot be maintained apart from this means. This being so, God wills that amidst the miseries of this world, we may always have a peaceable heart, and that we may be so assured of his goodness that we may rejoice and content ourselves therein, and that we may be able to glory against Satan and against all our enemies. And how is it possible Unless we regard ourselves as higher than this world, and we consider that although our condition is miserable with respect to the opinion of the flesh, yet since our God loves us, we surely must suffer. Now this passage is also the most excellent there is in the Holy Scripture to show us what the word patience implies. We must be taught by it. If we wish that God should acknowledge us as patient in our afflictions, we commonly say that a man is patient, although he may not have any true patience. For whoever suffers evil is called patient. But however much we may hold back being patient, we must abate our sadness. If there is some evil that comes to us, may it be made sweet by recognizing that God never ceases to procure our salvation, that we must be subject to him, and that is, it is entirely right that he should govern us according to his will. That is how patience is shown. But there is nothing better nor more useful than to behold the mirror which is here held up to us. We have seen that Job could have been overwhelmed having heard so much bad news. Now it is said that he has arisen and has torn his robe, has sheared himself, and has thrown himself to, to the ground to humble himself before God. Here we see in the first place that those who are patient bear well in affliction, but they feel displeased and anguished in their heart. For if we were as a tree trunk or a stone, there would be no virtue in us. Is a man who is not aware of his illness worthy of being praised? We shall surely see a feeble-minded person who laughs, who mocks all the world, and yet he is at the edge of the grave. But he is not aware of his illness. This then does not deserve to be held or accounted as virtue, for it is stupidity. Brute beasts sometimes feel nothing, but they are not virtuous on that account. So then let us note that the word patience does not mean that men should be drugged, that they should have no sadness, that they should not be at all offended when they experience some affliction. But the virtue is when they are able to restrain themselves and so hold themselves in bounds that they do not cease to glorify God in the midst of their affliction, that they are not troubled by anguish or so swallowed up as to quit everything, that they fight against their passions until they are able to conform to the good pleasure of God and to conclude, as Job here does, 
and to say that he, that is God, is entirely just. This is what we have to note when it is said, Job has torn his robe and shorn his head. For such fashions were customary in Oriental countries, as we know that there were more ceremonies in those regions which do not exist at all in the cold countries where we live. For when something happened which could move men to great anger, as a sign of grief, they tore their clothes. So much for the one item. Then in that country, where they were accustomed to letting their hair grow, they sheared themselves to display grief. On the other hand, where they sheared themselves, when they displayed grief, they let their hair grow. These are then signs of grief which here overtake Job when he tears his robe and shears himself. Now it is certain that his act was not in any sense pretended, as quite often those who wish to disguise themselves assume masks, in order that no one may guess that they are in great sadness, and that they may not cease to laugh in their heart. Job has not used such hypocrisy. Let us know then, when he has torn his robe and he has shorn his hair, that it was anguish and unlimited displeasure. And when he threw himself to the ground, it was yet another testimony. But it seems that Job here releases the bridle to his sadness, which would be a vice to condemn. For we know that men are only too excessive and overflowing in their passions. For although they restrain themselves and correct themselves as much as they can, yet they do not cease to go out of bounds. And there is nothing more difficult than to so restrain ourselves that we keep rule and control of ourselves. We see that men cannot rejoice without being too happy. Grief or sadness is a much more violent passion which carries men further away and does joy. So then we have to be on our guard always and whenever God sends us some adversity. For this is where we are accustomed to be overflowing the most. Now it is here said that Job tore his robe. It seems that he wishes to spur himself to be more sad and that he was for a man who sees himself so disfigured is astonished at himself. And then when it comes to his hair, it could be said that he sought aids to provoke himself and add to his grief, and that he was, as it were, driving himself to despair. And this, as I have said, would surely be condemnable, but in the first place, let us note that the scriptures here wish to express to us but the sadness of this holy person was so great and so vehement that he was not able to satisfy himself, that he went beyond ordinary custom by tearing his robe, to show that he experienced such anguish that it had grieved him to the bottom of his heart. This is what the scripture wishes to express to us. Now, although men ought to be on their guard, lest they be swallowed up by sadness when they are afflicted. Whenever God sends us some evil, we must think about it. For the common manner of repulsing every trial is very bad. And yet this is the way men have been in this respect. When they wish to be patient, they extinguished all thoughts of their troubles. They pushed them far away, and they withdrew from them. Briefly, they wish to be so stupefied that they might know or discern nothing. Now, entirely on the contrary, when God afflicts us, it is not to give us blows of the mallet upon the head in order that we might be dazed or drowsy, but he wills to induce us to think of our miseries. How? Beyond the necessity for keeping in memory our sins, in order to ask pardon for them and to be all the more careful to walk in a proper way, we are also instructed that it is a part of our life 
in order not to please ourselves, in order not to be inflated by vanity nor by presumption. And we are then to acknowledge the obligation that we have to our God because he treats us so tenderly, because he carries us, as it were, in his bosom. And then when we see that he cares for our life, let us look further. That is to say, let us reach toward the eternal kingdom, wherein is our true joy and rest. This, then, is how God does not cease to be pitiful toward us when he sends us some affliction. For it is in order that, examining what is in this, we may also acknowledge our condition. Also, it is good and useful that believers, when God afflicts them, are incited to think to themselves, Who am I? What is happening to me? Why am I thus afflicted? Let them think of all these things. Now this is how Job was able to tear his clothes and then to shear his head without offending God. Not that he wished to be precipitated into a great anger, but it tended to humility, as also it was to the ancients a sign of repentance. For if God sent pestilence or war, they wore sackcloth and threw ashes on their head. Why is that? It was not to nourish a sinful sadness, which St. Paul speaks in the Second Corinthians, verse 10, which he says is according to the world. We must flee from that. But that was of another sadness, which he says is according to God. When men, after having known that they are poor sinners, come before their judge, that they are there condemned, and they show that they deserve to be confounded. For he who wears sackcloth and who has ashes on his head protests that he no longer has any basis to glorify himself, that he must keep his mouth closed, that he is as if he were already buried, as if to say, I am not worthy that the earth should sustain me, but it ought to be on top of me. And God should cast me down so low that I should be, as it were, trodden underfoot. This is what Job meant by it. Seeing that God invited him to humility, he surely wished to conform. And for this cause, he tore his robe, sheared his hair. Now, though we see, as I already mentioned, that patience is not without affliction, that it is very necessary that the children of God should be sad, experiencing their pains. Nevertheless, they do not cease to have the virtue of patience when they resist their passions in such a way, that they do not fret against God, that they do not go out of bounds, that they do not kick against hope, but rather that they give glory to God, as immediately follows in the text. Job threw himself to the ground. He did it to worship. Note, it is true that this word threw means to recline or to lie down. But the purpose of humbling oneself before God and doing him homage is implied. We, saw, we see some who throw themselves on the ground, but they continue to be so angry that if it were possible, they would ascend above the clouds to wage war against God. We see those who are so carried away by spite, but it is because they cannot rush against God as they wish. Now Job, entirely to the contrary, throws himself on the ground in order to worship. Indeed, looking to God to humble himself before his high majesty. For when we experience the hand of God, it is then we ought to do more homage than ever. It is true that if God treats us kindly, we ought to be moved thereby to come to him. As in fact, he does invite us. The great goodness he uses, what is it 
except that he wishes to draw us to himself. But since we are so lazy about coming, he has to summon us and to show what right he has over us. As when a prince sees a vassal who is slow to do his duty, he sends him his officer to summon him. So God, seeing that we did not take into account coming to him, or perhaps that we do not come with such an ardent affection as would be properly required, invites us and calls us. Job then, knowing the purpose and true use of afflictions, threw himself on the ground in order to do homage to God, as if to say, Lord, it is true that until now I have served and honored thee. While I prospered and I was in great triumphs, I delighted in doing thee service. But what of it? I did not fully know myself, and now I see my weakness, that we are miserable creatures. So then, Lord, I come to do thee a new homage. When it pleases thee to afflict me in the world, Lord, I voluntarily yield myself to thee and ask nothing, unless it be to render myself subject to thy hand, whatever may come of it. So much for the saying, Job threw himself to the ground, having the aim of worshipping God. <clears throat> we now come to this saying, namely, that Job recognized man's condition. Naked came I up out of my mother's womb, he says, and naked I shall return there. When he says there, he implies that he is from elsewhere. Namely, from the womb of the earth, which is the mother of all. Or perhaps, like a man who has a heart ailment, he does not express all the words, but he speaks half. As we see that those who are extremely sad do not express all their words. Yet this protestation is clear enough. Namely, that Job wishes to say, well... I must return to the earth, just as I came out of the womb of my mother. It is true that this passage could be taken in a double sense. First, that it was a general statement. Behold men who come naked into the world. When they return, it is likewise. They do not take their riches, nor their honor, nor their pomp, nor their delights. They must go away and decay the earth must receive them. But the other exposition is more suitable. That Job applies this to himself, as if he said, Naked I came out of the womb of my mother. For a time, God willed to enrich me. But I had a great quantity of livestock. I had a large family. I had a multitude of children. In brief, I was well adorned with gifts and blessings with which God had enlarged me. Now he wills that I go away entirely naked. He had enriched me with all these things, and he has taken them from me in order that I may return to my first estate, and that I may now get ready to go to the grave. Now this sentence is good to note. For Job could not better prove his patience than by resolving to be entirely naked, inasmuch as the good pleasure of God was such. Surely men resist in vain. They may grit their teeth, but they must return entirely naked to the grave. Even the pagans have said that death alone shows the littleness of men. Why? Because we have such an abyss of covetousness that we would wish to gobble up all the earth. If a man has many riches, vines, meadows, and possessions, it is not enough. God would have to create new worlds if he wished to satisfy us. But what if we die? Six feet under, we decay and are reduced to nothing. So then, Death shows what our nature is. 
Nevertheless, we see many who fight against such a necessity. They build worthy sepulchers. They have triumphant funerals. It seems that such people wish to resist God, but they do not succeed at all. Now such is the general condition of men. But as for us, we must suffer patiently to be stripped by force when we have been clothed with goods and riches. We must allow, I say, that God should deprive us of everything and that we should live entirely undressed and naked and that we should be prepared to return to the grave in such a condition. This, I say, is how we shall prove that we are patient. And this is what Job wished to indicate in this passage. Thus, however and whenever we shall lack the goods of this world, we shall be hungry and thirsty, we shall be pressed by some afflictions, and we shall not have any help, let us think of our origin. Let us look at ourselves, who we are, and where we are going. For men abuse the fatherly care of God towards them when he proves to them what must happen to them. Surely we ought to have this very well imprinted in our hearts. Namely, that God does not will that we lack anything, that he would not have put us in the world unless he was willing to feed us. Yet we must always acknowledge that this comes from outside ourselves. And we should not suppose that we have our own right to what we possess by the gratuitous goodness of our God. If a man should feed me out of, the pure, out of his pure liberality and should say to me, come every day, you shall have so much wine, so much bread, I wish to entertain you. And it is not that I would oblige, my, oblige myself to you, but I would give you this. If thereupon I wish to bring a lawsuit to collect what I ought to beg for each day, receiving substance from his hand, if I wish to gain an income by what he gives me out of his pure liberality, would that not be a vile unthankfulness? I would deserve that someone should spit in my face. All the more are we bound to receive the goods which God gives us with all modesty, knowing that he owes us nothing, and because we are poor, we must come to him to beg every day from his infinite liberality. So then, when we have some need, let us run to him, as I have said, and acknowledge from where we have come. From the womb of my mother, entirely naked, a poor, miserable creature, I needed help and to be cleansed from the poverty in which I was. I would have utterly perished unless I had been helped from elsewhere. It pleased God then to feed and preserve me until now and to do me an infinite number of favors. And howsoever now he may will to afflict me, it is very right that I should bear everything patiently since it comes from his hand. This is what we have to note from what is shown shown us by Job, naked I came out of my mother's womb, and also naked I shall return to the grave. In summary, we think, when God shall have placed in our hands some goods, that the ownership of them ought to remain ours, that we shall be so accompanied by all of our riches that they will come to us to the grave that we ought never to be deprived of them. Now let us not reckon that way, for we deceive ourselves. But on the contrary, let us know that if it is the good pleasure of God to take away from us the goods with which he may have enlarged us, the next day we must be ready to be deprived of them. That it would do us no harm to be stripped in a minute of everything that we may have been able to acquire in our whole lifetime. Beside, Job leads us still further, saying, God has given it, and he has taken it away, 
Yet blessed be the name of the Lord. When he says that God had given it, he shows that it is reasonable that God should dispose of what he has put in our hands, since it is his own. For when God sends us his riches, it is not that he gives up his title, or that he may no longer have lordship as he ought to have, since he is the creator of the world. For the word creator implies that he has done everything in such a way that all power and sovereign dominion must remain his. And although men possess each one their portion, according as God has enlarged them by the goods of this world, yet he must always remain Lord and master of them. Job then, acknowledging this, entirely subjected himself to the good pleasure of God. And all of us confess this thing to be more than equitable. However, no one is willing to conform to it. Though this may be, as soon as God shall have let us enjoy some blessing for three days, it seems to us, if he takes it away from us, that he greatly injures us, and we shall murmur against him. And what is to be said of this? Recently I discussed unthankfulness, that it seems to us, when God has shown himself one time liberal toward us through his gratuitous goodness, that he ought never to fail us, no matter what we do. This then is a statement which is common enough, but so poorly practiced that it is clearly seen that it is understood by a very small number. So much more must we think over the meaning of the Lord has given it and the Lord has taken it away, that we may acknowledge what liberty our Lord has to give us enjoyment of his goods, and also when it may please him to deprive us of them in a minute. And this is why St. Paul exhorts us in 1 Corinthians 7.30 that inasmuch as the face of this world passes away and all things wear out and vanish, we should possess as though we possess not. That is to say, we should not set our heart on things. As it is said in another place, 1 Timothy 6.17, We must not trust in the uncertainty of riches. We must always be ready to say with Job, when God has stripped us of what he has given us, Lord, thou hast exercised thy right. Thou hast given it, and thou hast taken it away when it pleased thee. Here then is the summary of this passage, namely, whenever we think of the goods of this world, we should remember that we hold everything from God. And on what condition? It is not by property right that God should uh, should no longer wish any claim over it, and that he should no longer have any mastery over it. But if it pleased him to put it in our hands, it is on the condition that he may take it back when it seems good to him. Let us acknowledge then that we are so much more obligated to him when he shall have caused us to enjoy some benefit for a day, a month, or some space of time. And afterwards, if he strips us of it, that we should not find it too strange, but that we should run back to that acknowledgement which I have said. May God always retain such superiority over us that he can dispose of his own as seems good to him. It is awful for mortal men to control their wealth as they wish. Ought not much more control to be attributed to the living God? Seeing then how God ought to have the mastery, not only over what we possess, but also over our, per- uh, over our persons and over our children, we ought to humble ourselves before him by subjecting ourselves entirely to his holy will without any contradiction. But what do we see? There are very few who do this homage to God. 
It is true that everyone will surely say that it is God who has given them all that they possess. But what do they do about it? They claim him and raise themselves, as it were, in defiance of him. And what is this? I ask you, is this not mockery? Indeed, it is unbearable hypocrisy when after having protested that we hold everything from God, we nevertheless are never willing that he should dispose of it. We are not willing that he should change anything, but wish that he would leave us in peace and go away from us, as if we were separated from him and exempt from his jurisdiction. It is just as as if someone said, Oh, I'm, I'm content to acknowledge that such a one is my prince. I shall do him enough homage and obedience, but he shall not enter into my house. He should not come to ask for anything. He should not cause me any trouble. The world could not suffer such extreme depravity. Nevertheless, this is how they play with God. And what is the meaning of the confession Let us hold everything to be from him. Well, we are not willing that he should touch anything. We see then how the world openly mocks God. But we must always follow what is here shown. Namely, that that since God has given us what is in our hands, he may claim it back and take it back when he will. Furthermore, the final implication is added. Blessed be the name of the Lord. For by this, Job so submits himself to God that he confesses him to be good and just, although he is harshly afflicted from God's hand. I have said that this implies more inasmuch as one might uh, still be able to attribute to God entirely sovereign power by saying, very well, since he has given it, he can surely take it away. But nevertheless, he would not confess that God did it justly and reasonably, as there are many who, when they are afflicted, accuse God of cruelty or of too great a severity so that they cannot reserve for him the right to take it back, or the right to take back what he has given to them. And they did not consider, as I've said, that they should possess wealth in such a way that they could be stripped of it the next day. There are very few who hold this consideration in such a way that remain peaceable in it, that confess that there is nothing better than to be entirely subject to the majesty of God and to recognize that if he let us do according to our desires, there would be only confusion. But when he governs us according to his will, it is for our profit and our salvation. This is the point of view to which we must come. So, we see now that the sentence implies more when it is said, Blessed be the name of the Lord. For we must not only split hairs over words, we must consider from what affection this proceeds, and that it is said in truth and without pretense. For how is it possible that we should bless the name of God except by first of all confessing that he is just? Now he who murmurs against God, as if he were cruel and inhuman, thereby curses God. And as much as is in him rises up against God. He who does not recognize that God is his father, that he is his child, who does not render testimony of God's goodness, does not bless God at all. And why not? Because those who do not taste the mercy and the grace which God performs toward men when he afflicts them must gnash their teeth and throw and discharge some venom against them. To bless then the name of God implies that we are all well persuaded that he is just and equitable in his nature. And not only this, but that he is good and merciful. 
This is how we shall be able to bless according to the example of God, or according to the example of Job, the name of God. It will be by acknowledging his justice and his equity, and then by acknowledging also his grace and his fatherly goodness toward us. And this is why the text also adds in conclusion, in all these things Job sinned not or attributed to God anything unreasonable. Or literally, Job put forward nor imposed upon God nothing which was without reason. And it is a manner of speaking which is very worthy to be observed. Why is it that men fret so when God send them things entirely contrary to their desire? Except that they do not acknowledge that God does everything by reason and that he has just cause. For if we had well imprinted on our hearts all that God does is founded in good reason, it is certain that we would be ashamed to so chafe against him when we know that he has just occasion to dispose of things as we see. Now therefore, it is especially said that Job attributed to God nothing without reason. That is to say, that he did not imagine that God did anything was not, that was not just and equitable. So much for one item. But we must note above all the words in God or to God. This implies much. For we do not think that the works of God should be spoken of so abominably as we speak of them. As soon as God does not send what we have desired, we dispute against him. We bring suit, not that we appear to do this, but our manner shows that this is nevertheless our intent. We consider every blow, asking, why has this happened? But from what spirit is this pronounced? From a poisoned heart. As if we said, this thing should have been otherwise. I see no reason for this. Meanwhile, God will be condemned among us. This is how men exasperate themselves. And in this, what do they do? It is as if they accuse God of being a tyrant or harebrained, who asked only to put everything in confusion. Such horrible blasphemy blows out of the mouths of men, yet very few think about it. However, the Holy Spirit wished to tell us that if we wish to render glory to God and to bless his name properly, we must be persuaded that God does nothing without reason. So then let us not attribute to him either cruelty or ignorance, as if he did things in spite or unadvisedly. But let us acknowledge that God proceeds in everything, and through everything, with admirable justice, with goodness and infinite wisdom, so that there is only entire uprightness or equity in all that he does. Now it is true that here is an article to deduce, namely, how Job recognized that God took away from him what had been carried away by robbers, which seems to us very strange. But what we cannot explain this hour, we shall reserve until tomorrow. It is enough to have shown that if we are afflicted, we must not think that it happens without reason, but that God has just cause to do it. And that whenever we are tried and anguished, let us run back to him, let us pray to him, that he will give us grace to acknowledge that nothing happens to us in this world except as he disposes. And indeed to be certain that he disposes in such manner that everything always comes back to our salvation. And when we shall have this knowledge, it will cause us to bear patiently the afflictions which he will send us. It will also be able to make us humble ourselves before him. And that having tasted for ourselves his fatherly goodness, we shall ask only to glorify him in everything and through everything, 
as much in affliction as in prosperity. This Reformation audio track is a production of Stillwater's Revival Books. You are welcome to make copies and give them to those in need. SWRB makes thousands of classic Reformation resources available, free and for sale, in audio, video, and printed formats. It is likely that the sermon or book that you just listened to is also available on cassette or video, or as a printed book or booklet. Our many free resources, as well as our complete mail-order catalog, containing thousands of classic and contemporary Puritan and Reform books, tapes, and videos at great discounts, is on the web at www.swrb.com. We can also be reached by email at swrb at swrb.com, by phone at 780-450-3730, by fax at 780-468-1096, or by mail at 4710-37A Avenue, Edmonton, that's E-D-M-O-N-T-O-N, Alberta, abbreviated capital A, capital B, Canada, T6L 3T5. You may also request a free printed catalog. And remember that John Calvin, in defending the Reformation's regulative principle of worship, or what is sometimes called the scriptural law of worship, commenting on the words of God, which I commanded them not, neither came into my heart, from his commentary on Jeremiah 7.31, writes, God here cuts off from men every occasion for making evasions, since he condemns by this one phrase, I have not commanded them, whatever the Jews devised. There is then no other argument needed to condemn superstitions than that they are not commanded by God. For when men allow themselves to worship God according to their own fancies, and attend not to his commands, they pervert true religion. And if this principle was adopted by the papists, all those fictitious modes of worship in which they absurdly exercise themselves would fall to the ground. It is indeed a horrible thing for the papists to seek to discharge their duties towards God by performing their own superstitions. There is an immense number of them, as it is well known, and as it manifestly appears. Were they to admit this principle, that we cannot rightly worship God except by obeying his word, they would be delivered from their deep abyss of error. The prophet's words, then, are very important when he says that God had commanded no such thing and that it never came to his mind, as though he had said that men assume too much wisdom when they devise what he never required, nay, what he never knew.